I don't remember what the starting point was. I mean, I guess I wanted, I guess in the beginning I realized there were different sounds to different typewriters. This is the artist Ignacio Riarte at his studio in Berlin, but his story begins in an office. I always worked in industrial companies. A couple of different ones actually, where he was doing standard routine office work and it wasn't going that great. I was pretty bad in what I was doing. For a number of reasons. I'm not a very good multitasker, pretty distracted, I'm a dreamer. I tend to procrastinate things that I don't want to do or not, I'm not very good in doing. Which put him in a difficult position. I started to try to find a way out. Until one day he noticed something interesting at another office. So a guy whose only job was to find your file. First thing that would come to mind is let's order them alphabetically. But he didn't. Somebody came there and wanted his file. He had to go through the whole pile. This was his only job. If he made it too fast, he would have had nothing to do. Or maybe he would have gotten another job. Maybe he didn't want another job. So this, to me, was an incredible image, you know, this idea of somebody being inefficient on purpose to prolong the time of work was a very extreme and strange idea. So he starts to experiment with this concept, doing office work, but without the actual work. And if you're wondering why, then you're not alone. Everybody was saying, like, why would you do that? I mean, why would you go home after sitting for eight, nine hours in the office and sit for another two, three hours? again in front of a computer doing Excel labyrinths, you know, makes no sense. But then a couple of years later, he got an art residency and quit his job. Suddenly I, I could call myself an artist because this residency was sort of established. Angad it's called in Barcelona. I had no money whatsoever, so it didn't start like a natural thing. It was really more like, um, I need to do it. I need to draw now. There's nothing else I can do with no money. I was in these studios and somebody said, well, I like the sound of the scribbling, you know. And I recorded the sound and now it's a piece that's called Big Monochromes and it comes with a soundtrack that you can listen over headphones while you stand in front of the drawing. Work. There's a word that's used much more than it's understood. There's a strange air in offices, there's a strange mood, strange light and and you feel locked up very often. At about the same time each day, the morning mail is distributed. Sorting it, sorting it, sorting it is one of Jean's responsibilities. So many people spend so much of their adult lives in offices, but because it is so obvious and unremarkable, it's hard to even notice it. It's not something that you pay attention to because that's, that's how it is and what it is. But if you've ever had a Kafkaesque moment when you've asked yourself, what kind of existence is this? This is the kind of question that this work is about. Well, I don't really have good memories from my work past, but I would be lying if I said that this is torture. It's not only torture. I enjoy it and I, I think it's fundamentally different because it's improductive. This is out of free will and it doesn't have to obey the laws of efficiency. And surprisingly, most of the time, it feels a lot less about the frustrations of daily routine and a lot more about capturing moments between moments of daydreaming and spacing out. Or as he puts it, your mind is relaxing. You could be in the cubicle and do it and everybody would think you would be working. It looks like work, but it's not. It's like a break, it's like a, you know, a vacuum without efficiency, without yeah, doing what you're supposed to do. So now we come to the typewriters, until recently the most important machine in the modern office. Typewriters were the soundtrack of offices. For example, in films, when you enter a press room or an office, there's always this announcing typewriter sound. And then I thought, wouldn't it be nice to make an homage to the sound of typewriters with a human voice? And then immediately then this guy popped up. He was to my generation, our first encounter with beatboxing. I googled his name and found a manager of him, 
and wrote him offering him a lot of money. And then they said, yes, of course. And then it took me a year to find the money to pay him before I could do it. And when you think about it, typewriters became so synonymous with office routine that even when computers arrived, we basically never gave them up. During the Industrial Revolution, when they introduced the weaving machine, there were these guys that would destroy the machines. They would fight the machine because they were these experts in weaving and they knew this machine will destroy my job. There's a good reason that in 84, when the first PC came out, it slipped inside the shell of a typewriter. Take away the typewriter of the secretary or of the accountant and put a, a computer instead, you would not feel, oh, this is the illimited machine that will change the world and this company will not need me anymore in the future because they have this computer, you know? It felt very familiar. I mean, a computer is not a super typewriter. It's definitely not a super typewriter. But they made us sort of understand it is. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, sechs, sie, ben, acht, neun, zehn, elf, zwölf. These days, he continues to explore the power of routines with a kind of excessive audio installation. It's basically a male voice counting every second. But instead of using one number per second, he uses one syllable per second. As time goes by, the numbers get longer and longer and you advance less and less. A work shift would be eight hours and in this work you count for eight hours. As the way it turned out, I feel it's very hypnotic or meditative. Meditation on time. Here in this matrix you have several sequences. You know, you have diagonal and horizontal and vertical sequences. This work is about mixing colors. And mixing colors is something that is not allowed for an office employee. In this case, we do it by overlaying. It seems like a very limiting choice to frame the confinement of the office using just office supplies. But that, says Ignacio, is just the point. It's like a bird that is inside a cage and flies from one corner to the other and does periods and tries everything you can do inside this very small space. And what does the bird learn from that? It learns the limits of its own freedom. So that's what I do. I stay inside the cubicle and I try to find every imaginable language and every imaginable gesture or, or artwork that might derive from routines that take place in the office. These are the colors that you can use in Excel. These are the, the widths of an Excel cell. These are, I don't know, these are all the letters in an alphabet. These are all the seconds in an eight hour shift. So there's all, you know, it's, it's in a way, the options are limited. Some of the work is funny, and some is quite abstract, but there is one idea that is always there. The feeling that there is great freedom in the moments when you're just not doing what you're supposed to. I couldn't really say what else is there to do if not to work. I mean, I don't have the alternative, really. Maybe what you might take out of it is see all the things that you have around you as a playground for art, and, and maybe even paying more attention to, to the gestures that you do on a daily basis. Next up, season one continues in episode three. What would have happened had he only stayed standing, not doing anything? In which we learn how doing nothing in a time of crisis can save the day. 